It's a very straightforward chapter, uh, not much deep theology in it. It's very simple to understand, yet very, very profound. It has to be I mean, actually applied in lives. And the whole chapter can be divided into three parts. Very, very important parts. Verse 1 to verse 9 is about the people of this world. How in the last days, what will happen in the world? Paul writes to Timothy and reminds them about what's going to happen in the last days. The, the way people behave in this world. Verse 1 to 9. Verse 10 to 13, uh, Paul talks about himself. In the light of the wicked things happening in the world today, Paul is exhorting Timothy to look at Paul. Look at me, he says. You know all about my life. Then from verse 14 to 17, he talks about Timothy. First the world in the last days. Then the example of himself, Paul, to Timothy. And then how Paul uh, Timothy has to respond in the present situation and how he has to live. So three sections. 1 to 9 about the world. 10 to 13 about Paul. 14 to 17 about Timothy. And when Timothy comes in, that's why we also come in. We also have to imitate what the, the Apostle Paul instructs Timothy because all of us are servants of God and we do well to take to heart what God's word has for us. Let me read from verse 1. This straightforward it is. You can just follow with me as I read slowly. Not much to explain. It's like the morning newspaper and the TV news we see today. And Paul's talking about the last days. But mark this from verse 1. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, Treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They both don't, don't go together. Loving things of this world and loving God. Look at verse 5. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. Having a form of godliness appearing to be godly. And that's very church, many churches today who go in the name of the church have a form of godliness, but don't believe in the power of living for Christ. Power of holiness, power of godliness, power of following Jesus. To be godly is to imitate the life of Jesus. And as we imitate his life, we'll experience the power of God uh, in our lives. And then he says, have nothing to do with them. Now, when people know what they're doing is wrong, and they persist in doing that, deliberately keep on sinning, no point being associated with them. They know what they're doing is wrong. They do not know we have to be with them and show them the way they have to go. But this refers to people who have a form of godliness but denying his power and they choose to go away from God. In fact, when Jesus spoke about the last days, he spoke about the increase of wickedness. In 24th chapter of Matthew, verse 12, he says, Because the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Most people's love will grow cold. Love for God will grow cold in the last days. Because wickedness will increase. Romans 5.20, Romans 5.20, Paul writes, In the last days, sin will increase. Where sin increases, grace abounds. Praise God, you and me, are recipients of God's grace. We know that we are saved by grace. We also live by grace. We stand firm on the grace of God. And thank God, while the wickedness is increasing in the world, they can receive the grace from God and live a victorious life. So this is a typical morning newspaper story. Things happening in the last days. But don't be surprised. These things will happen. It's for us not to be distracted by the terrible things happening in the world. Rather, we follow the Lord. Then let's look, go on from here. From verse 6. People who have the form of godliness but denying his power. Referring to them. Paul writes. They are the kind who worm their way into homes. And gain control over weak will, weak will women. 
who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. He's referring to the people, yes, uh, people who do all these things. They went to uh, people's houses, speak with women, and uh, they sin against God, always trying to learn but never accepting the truth. Truth is Jesus. They're trying to learn, they're following, they're pursuing knowledge for knowledge's sake, but no heart for God. So they don't, don't even know the truth, they don't accept the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, so also these men oppose the truth. Men of depraved minds, who as far as the truth, the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will never get very far because, as in the case of these men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. Now, who are these two? Janus and Jambres in the Old Testament. These two names are actually Egyptian names. Janus, actually pronounced Janus, not J. Janus and Jambres. Egyptian names. According to Bible scholars, it refers to the magicians in Pharaoh's court. When Moses did the miracle, when he threw the staff into the ground, became a snake. And the magicians who were indulging in sorcery in Egypt in Pharaoh's court, same miracle they also did. And many Bible scholars attribute Janus and Jombres to those magicians, sorcerers, who did the miracle that Moses did. And uh, three miracles they could emulate. First one was the rod becoming a snake. Second was the water in the river Nile becoming blood. Third was frogs all over the land coming from the river Nile. Three miracles these Egyptian sorcerers did it, magicians. The fourth miracle, the dust becoming gnats and uh, swarming all over the place, they could not do it. Look at Exodus 7 chapter, verse 11. It talks about the magicians, what they did. Sorcerers. They emulated the first three miracles of uh, Moses. The fourth miracle, the gnats, they could not do. And they even say, 8th chapter of Exodus, verse 19, this is the finger of God. Only God could do this. And they knew fully well, their doing was from the sorcery, uh, from, from uh, occult. This only God can do. I mean, they're not doing by God's power. They're doing by some other power. They knew that also. So, Daniel's numbers, according to many Bible scholars, are referred to uh, these two, these Egyptians, who opposed Moses at Pharaoh's court. But of course, God vindicated Moses. So, there are people against us in the world. The last day, there'll be more of such people. And what Paul, what Paul is saying here is, their folly be known to everybody. One day, will everyone come to know about them. So, he's talking about things happening in the world. Also in the so-called Christian church, where they have a form of godliness, rituals, traditions of forefathers, but no power. They indulge in all these things. So these nine verses talk about what will happen in the last days. We shouldn't be surprised by that. It's all prophesied in the Bible. And the Lord, in fact, said, because the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Christians, unfortunately, look at all these things and they lose their zeal for God. The love for God grows cold. They forsake their first love. First love is for Jesus when you accept Christ. But then after some time when things go wrong around you, you tend to lose their zeal for God. Then from verse 10, Paul tells Timothy, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, Faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering. What a combination of attributes. You know all about my teaching. I go to each one of them and I'm going to explain. His teaching came from the Lord. And, and Timothy knew that. In Galatians 1.11, Paul writes, The gospel of is not something man made up. I didn't receive from any man. Nor was I taught it. I received a revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all we discussed the other day about how when he became a believer, Paul, when he was in Damascus, in Damascus, on the way he became a believer, going to Damascus, there he began to preach immediately after being baptized and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Then he goes to Arabia, of all places. For the time he stays there, comes back to Damascus, then goes to 
uh, uh, to uh, Jerusalem. And then much later again goes to Jerusalem uh, after 14 years. His, his teaching came from the Lord in Arabia, I believe. So he said, you know all about my teaching, where it comes? It comes from the Lord. I wasn't taught by man, I was taught by the Lord himself. My teaching, my way of life. Now, Paul's life is very transparent. It's very important that, very important that a, a man of God, a person in the ministry, he very transparent to people he is put in charge of. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said about himself and the apostles in John chapter 10 verse 14, I know my sheep, my sheep know me. I know my sheep, my sheep know me. Transparency. Be open to the people you are ministering to. He said, Timothy, Timothy, you know about my teaching, where it comes, my way of life, and Paul's way of life was known to Timothy because he observed him very carefully. In fact, when he wrote to, when he wrote to the Corinthian church, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 16, 17, he writes, I urge you to imitate me. Right in the church in Corinth. Imitate me. I urge you to imitate me. Verse 17. And for this reason, I'm sending Timothy to you. Timothy will remind you he will remind you about my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. He will remind you. You already know about it. You know about it. He will remind you about what? My way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Whatever I teach everywhere in every church, I live it. You know that. And Timothy will remind you. So Timothy knew about Paul's life, how his teaching actually came from his life. So he teaching, my way of life, my purpose. Why I'm doing what I'm doing. What is his purpose in ministry? Twofold purpose. One is to glorify the Lord. Philippians chapter 3 verse 3. And number two, to build up people. 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 verse 8 and 13 chapter verse 10. 13 chapter 2nd Corinthians verse 10 and 10 chapter verse 8. Where he talks about his ministry God gave him as an apostle to build people up not to tear them down. For edification not destruction. So you know all about my teaching, my way of life, which is what I teach everywhere in every church. My purpose, purpose is to glorify the Lord's name and build up people. Okay, let me go on. Faith, patience, love, endurance. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. You know all about my faith. My faith is in him, not in people, not in the church, not in my own ministry, but on the Lord Jesus Christ. Patience. See, faith and patience are very important. They go together in the context of receiving the promise of God. Faith and patience. If you look at Hebrews 6 12, we read Hebrews 6 12. It's written in the letter writes to the Jewish Christians. Don't be lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise of God. Through faith and patience, all of us can inherit the promise of God. And Paul said, Timothy, Timothy, you know all about me, my faith, my patience. So much so, Paul was totally confident of the promise of God for him. Especially in the context of rewards in heaven. Crown of righteousness, which he's going to get. Fourth chapter of 7, 8, he talks about that. Crown of righteousness, which he's going to get. Confident, because he had faith and patience. Faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering. Love. His entire ministry was actually constrained by the love of God. 
In 2 Corinthians 5.14, he writes, The love of God compels me. I'm constrained by the love of God. It's so vitally important that whatever we speak should come from love. We speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 Speaking the truth in love, we go into a head that is Christ. So, teaching, way of life, purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering. And uh, Timothy knew exactly what happened to Paul. And then he goes on to say, where, he, where all he ministered? In Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Actually, Timothy was from Lystra. He is from Lystra, actually. His father was a Greek. Mother was a Jewess. Her name was Eunice. Grandmother was Lois. And uh, he was a witness to Paul's sufferings. You know all about my, pay, uh, my faith, patience, persecution, suffering, endurance, everything you know. So complete package. Timothy knew about Paul. And then Paul goes on to explain. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Look at verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. He's telling what happened to him. He said, everyone, not only me. You know what happened to me? You know all about my ministry, my life, everything you know. So I went through all that. Patience, faith, love, endurance, persecution, suffering. In fact, everyone. That's so we come in. As Timothy comes in. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So don't be surprised at persecution. Whereas evil men will go from bad to worse. And the one problem many Christians have today is why wicked people flourish in this world. Because here you are obeying God, following the ways of God, and you find that people are against God who claim to know God, but they are hypocrites, they flourish in the world. They flourish in the world. And it gets, a lot of confusion can happen in the churches because of that. We shouldn't be surprised. Jeremiah had the question, why well, we keep flourish in the world? Habakkuk had that question. Asaf had that question. To everyone on God gave the answer about them, not about the people flourishing. Don't be worried about them, he says. When Jeremiah questioned God about wicked people flourishing, he tells God, Jeremiah chapter 12, the first few verses, he writes, Lord, you're always righteous when I bring a case before you. Yet I will speak to you about your justice. Why is the way of the wicked prosper? Why are the faithless liberties? You plant them, they take a root, they grow and bear fruit. Your name is upon the lips, but the hearts are far from you. Then he's advising God. Take them and butcher them, slaughter them, kill them. He's so frustrated with wicked people flourishing in the world. Look at God's answer. Verse 5. If you are raised with men on foot and they won't you out, how can you compete with horses? If you're going to put up with the smart problems, how are you going to face tripper tests in life? If you stumble in safe country, how can you manage the thickest by the river Jordan? So in other words, it's very common to find wicked people flourishing in the world, wicked people. They claim to know God. The name is upon the lips, but the hearts are far from God. Don't be surprised. And if you obey God, if you want to follow him, he'll be persecuted. Of course, for you and me, the word persecution is too big a word to apply in our lives. We face difficulties, yes, in the world, but not really persecution. None of us has shed blood for Christ. None of us has been lost arm or leg like it happened in Siberia when I went there in the church. We have some, some problems with people, but don't be surprised. In 1 John 3.13, John writes to Christians, don't be surprised if the world hates you. So wicked people go from bad to worse. Sin will increase. Don't get frustrated. 
Don't let your love grow cold. Timothy is being told by Paul, this all this will happen, Timothy. You know about me. So, I'm persecuted. I got distributed from the persecution. It got me out of it. Yet, everybody who chooses to live a godly life will have persecution. That's a choice. They can compromise, take the mean path, and then escape troubles, compromise with the world, try to become very, very popular. But if we choose to follow the Lord all the way, then it's part of our calling to face trials. Philippians 129. For being granted to you, not only to believe upon him, but also to suffer for him. Then he goes on to explain uh, about Timothy now. Verse 14. So far he spoke about wicked people flourishing in the world, increasing wickedness. Then about himself. Verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have been convinced of. Because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. As for you, continue. Meaning, don't get distracted by things happening around you. I don't know what is happening in Ephesus. The people coming from Pergamum and Thyatira, confusing people. Pergamum was a place where Satan had his throne. The book of Revelation tells us that. And his people must have come there and confused. So Timothy is here. One side is intimidated by the elders in the church. Other side, from outside, there are people coming and confusing. And Paul tells Timothy, you don't be upset by all these things. As for you, continue in the faith. And from infancy, you've known the scriptures. Because his mother and grandmother were very, very good believers. He learned scriptures from them. They were strong in faith. And the faith that they had became infectious. Timothy also had the same faith. So Paul can tell Timothy, you continue with the scriptures. From infancy, you have known the scriptures. Continue living, living by the scriptures. Because they are able to make you wise unto salvation. When you have God's wisdom, you can handle difficult circumstances. And God's wisdom will give us, uh, God's word when you obey, will give us wisdom. Remember the time when, before the Israelites entered the land of Canaan, Moses repeated the law to the Israelites. Deuteronomy means repetition of the law. Repetition of the law. And uh, in the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 6, he tells them, observe carefully all these commandments. Observe carefully all these commandments. For this will show your wisdom among the nations who will hear the decrees and say, surely this will get nations of wise and understanding people. As you obey God's word, wisdom will be manifested to the people around and they will say, look at your life, how you obey the word of God, how you live. These are wise and understanding people. So as we obey scriptures, we will manifest the wisdom of God. When you have God's wisdom, we will know how to handle difficult people and difficult circumstances. Paul said, Timothy, Timothy, don't get distracted by all these things. You know my life. You know what's happening in the world today. You know me. You know the scriptures. So continue living by the scriptures. They're able to make you wise unto salvation. Now look at the next verse. Beautiful verse. Very, very familiar to all of us. 1617. All scripture is God's breath. It's used for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. So that the man of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You continue in scripture. You know scripture from childhood, you know scripture. Your mother, grandmother all taught you. You are faith from them. Continue. Living by the word. For all scriptures, God breath. You are living by something breathed by God. And this word is useful for correcting, rebooking, re correcting, rebooking, training righteousness, that the man of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So this word of God you use with the wisdom of God. First, apply the scriptures in your life. You manifest wisdom. 
wisdom you can teach. In Colossians 3.16, maybe, Paul writes, Colossians 3, chapter 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. As you teach and much one another with all wisdom. So telling Timothy the same thing. Let scriptures be in you. Live by the scriptures. You know from scripture from, in, from infancy. We make you wise. When you have wisdom, you can correct, rebook, encourage. For all scripture is God's breath. How beautiful this is. It's amazing these chapters. And it's like almost like today's situation. World is going into all kinds of sins. Terrible things happening around us. Then the examples of God's people in the Bible and contemporary world also, whom we can emulate, that faith we can emulate. And then we live by scriptures. Don't get distracted, Paul does Timothy. Continue in what you know already. Because that will make you wise unto salvation. And when you have that wisdom, you can correct, rebook, encourage. Because all scripture is God's breath. It's flawless. Second Peter chapter 1, 2021 says, No prophecy of scripture ever came, ever came in prophecy on interpretation. For prophecy never has already the will of man. But men spoke from God and were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 5. Proverbs 35. Every word of God is flawless. So since we have the scriptures given to us and how blessed we are today, you and me, we've got 66 books of the Bible. 66 books. Timothy never had that. Paul never had that. They never had it in the first century. We have so much of the scripture given to us. Every one of them is God's breath. 66 books full of the breath of God. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us to teach us how wonderful we can be when we live by the scriptures, become wise, strong, and rise above every situation in this world today. Sin is increasing in the world, but grace abounds. And God wants each one of us to manifest grace, his wisdom, his power, and be a blessing as he blesses us. Praise God. I'm going to close.